Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum and welcome to the program. It is, of course, the Wednesday edition of Let's Talk with me, Julie Ali, coming through to you live from uh, Sunning Hill in Johannesburg. This is ITV Networks. Great to be with you. Do keep us company right up until 10 o'clock. Two very, very interesting interviews um, lined up. We'll be talking with Dr. Hayden Nibbs. He is a clinical psychologist and we'll be talking anger management. That is our second interview for the morning. But first up, Africa Check is in studio with us to talk to us about fact checking, to talk about what's crap on WhatsApp and a whole host more. Kaylee Clifford is my guest. She's a researcher at Africa Check, and I think it's about time we know that our handheld devices are almost um, uh, part of our lives, part of our bodies, but with it comes a huge amount of risk, misinformation, and also fake news. And it's about time we became aware of being responsible and putting out uh, responsible news. Kaylee, morning, welcome to the program. Morning, thanks for having me. Great to have you here and um, long, long, long overdue. Um, very especially because we know about the fake news or misinformation it's now been re-termed it used to be fake news yeah. they're now using a politically correct a term which is misinformation how widespread is this should be should we be worried and is this what life looks like and is going to look like in this age of technology yeah, so I mean, fact checking from a traditional point of view has always been part of the media space and the journalism space. Um, but I think over the years, um, in the rush of publishing cycles, um, in the, the loss of production revenue, um, we've seen somewhat of a, a decline in traditional fact checking. Um, and this, I think, has been made a lot more complicated by the rise of social media. Um, we are overwhelmed with so much information coming at us from all points of life. And um, it is, I would say, in today's age, much more difficult to know what information we can trust and what information we can't trust. Um, and so Africa Check's role in this is really just to verify information that we find in the public domain. So that could be whether said by a president or a public official or a prominent media personality um, and and really just fact check what they're saying and, and let people know whether what they're saying is true or not. So what medium would you utilize to then disseminate that information? So we run two dedicated fact checking websites, one in English and one in French. And uh, we largely, most of our fact checking workers <clears throat> excuse me, we publish on our website. Um, but we also try to, of course, filter that into social media because that's a huge part of, of spreading information. So we um, are very active on Facebook and Twitter and recently have launched a, a wonderful service on WhatsApp because that's also a huge area where we're seeing a lot of misinformation being spread. So the moment you come across any misinformation, be trivial or important, do you guys then fact check and uh, put out the correct information on all your different platforms? Yeah, so I think um, an important starting point for us is that we know we can't fact check everything. I mean, hundreds of claims are made every single day. So we need to select the most important claims to fact check. Um, how do we do that? It's, it's a bit of a process, um, but a, a good starting point is that we can't fact check statements of opinion. So if somebody says um, Ronaldo is the best soccer player in the world, that's a very difficult statement for us to fact check. Um, so we, we like statements that have um, very definitive um, time frames, maybe quite specific about what is being referred to. So um, every year, for example, we fact check the president's State of the Nation address and we will look for claims like um, in the last 24 years, the size of the economy has tripled or doubled in size. That is a, that is a statement that we can fact check um, using publicly available information, which is another important step in our fact So let's process. assume you then fact check the State of the Nation address. Yes. Um, and you find that he, the president has either over-exaggerated yep. or it just is not true at all. What do you d then do? Do you call him out on it and say, Mr. President, you've misinformed the South African public? And how do you then inform the South African public that 
um, we were misled by the president. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's a, that's the last step in the fact-checking process is always, always to go back to the person that you are fact-checking and let them know what you found. Because we always say it's it's not about catching people out or proving people wrong to say, <laughs> ha, you were wrong and we're right. And we're actually just trying to get people to be more responsible about the way absolutely. that they share information. So we absolutely um, will go back to the president's office and let them know what we found. Um, and our experience is that they're really quite receptive to that. Wow. Okay. Um, so we have seen some improvements in the way that um, they're doing their research and the way that they're giving these State of the Nation addresses. Um, and then, of course, we publish the information on our website for everyone to see, um, as well as on, on social media. OK, you're going to give us that website address in a minute or yes. two. But who is Kaylee Clifford? I know you study international relations, yes. but you've now ended up as a researcher at Africa Check. Talk to us about the work you do then. Yeah. What exactly? Africa Check has come into being in 2010, 2012? 2012. Okay. Yeah. And the important role they play in South Africa? Yeah, so, I mean, you're right, uh, my background is international relations, but I've been working as a researcher at Africa Check for about a year now. Um, it's very, very exciting and challenging work. Um, the bulk of what I do is fact-checking, so looking at statements that are made and going through the fact-checking process and verifying whether they are true or not. And, and how laborious is that? It depends. It really depends on um, the type of fact check that you're doing. Sometimes you start something and you think that it's going to be quite straightforward and it ends up being way more complicated than that. So um, it's very different one day to the next. Um, but we also work with a lot of, um, so we're, we're looking at a lot of new projects on different social media platforms, working with AI technologies. Um, so very, very exciting, yeah. And Africa Check, I know that you're um, with the School of Journalism at Wits University. Yeah. And there are two other offices in Africa. Who initiated <coughs> Africa Check and how important a role is Africa Check playing in South Africa and the rest of the continent? So Africa Check was founded by Peter Cunliffe Jones in um, 2012. He was originally a reporter with AFP um, based in Nigeria when he saw how the spread of polio was affecting Nigerian kids and how misinformation around the disease and how it spread and how you can cure it um, was really affecting people and leading to the spread of the disease at a time when it was actually being eradicated in the rest of the world. And he really just saw a need for people to have access to correct and verified information. So. Um, um, we've been going since 2012 and we have offices in Kenya, Nigeria and Senegal as well. And the type of work you do here in at Wits University or at your offices at Wits University, yeah. is it solely focused on South Africa or would you fact check information from around the world? Yeah, so I mean there is obviously a local focus here um, but we we would fact check things based on merit um, if we feel that they are important. If it's a topic that's important to society and people need to know the truth about something, we would fact check it. Um, why we fact check can also be determined by who made the claim. So um, how big of a reach did it have? Um, if it was made by somebody prominent and this message is really spreading quite far, um, then we would fact check it. And of course, um, sometimes there is a level of, of harm involved. How harmful is this statement if it goes unchecked? So let's look at that last statement you've made, mm. how harmful the statement could be if not fact checked and corrected mm. um, in terms of a very prominent person or a prominent organisation. Um, and it is believed that perhaps there's defamation of character uh, involved there. You fact check, realise that this person's really been harmed by this information. What's the next step? Is your job done? Essentially, yes. Um, from we we would kind of leave it up there. It's it's not really within our expertise to then take it further. I think our role is really just um, to take that information and verify it to the best of our abilities, and then share it with the public. And the person that's been harmed, the victim, so to speak, would you say to him or her or the organisation, um, this is what we have uncovered, you know, through our fact checking mm -hmm. process. We now leave you with this information. Do yeah. with it what you will. Absolutely. I mean, as I said, we would always go back to the organisation or the person who made the claim and tell them what we found. And hopefully they would, from there on, do the, the responsible thing and retract a statement or correct themselves. Um, yeah. Um, you indicated that obviously you guys um, really have your eye on government officials, top ministers, yeah. government. 
um, I should imagine, top corporates and important people, possibly even uh, South African celebrities. Mm. What happens if I, as an ordinary lay person, comes along to you and suggests that there's been some misinformation about me on social media, um, it's harmed me terribly, uh, can you help? Can can you help fact check? And then can I take that information away? Perhaps take it to a lawyer and mm. sue the uh, perpetrators for defamation, for example. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if that's quite <laughs> our role. Um, as I said, there are a number of things that would affect whether we fact check something. What would um, they be? So it's if if the statement is presented as fact and we can fact check it using publicly available information. Um, it is determined by who made the statement, how far the, the message has spread. Um, yeah, and really just um, what kind of an impact it would have if the statement went unchecked. So it, it yeah, it would need to have quite a, a large reach. All right, so for someone like myself, an ordinary mm. lay person, yeah. um, if I find that there's been a lot of crap uh, about me on social media, it really is up to me to consult with a lawyer and perhaps open a case of defamation or whatever. I'd actually have to um, finger the perpetrator, find out who started the rumour or that chain of um, misinformation. Yeah. So lots of inf investigation would have to happen. It's really up to me to go out and correct it. Yeah, I, I don't think that that's really within our area of expertise, but certainly... You'd be will... overloaded if it was. Yeah, precisely. <laughs> but uh, yeah, we, we deal with publicly available information and we fact check statements that have been made in the public domain. Right, let's go for our first ad break. We'll be back to talk about what's crap on WhatsApp. Yes. Kaylee Clifford is my guest. She's a researcher at Africa Check. They are with the School of Journalism at Wits University and we're going to be talking about misinformation on social media platforms. Mm -hmm. Kaylee Clifford from Africa Check is here talking about fact che checking and also what's crap on WhatsApp. Fascinating indeed. And undoubtedly, I think after this interview, we are all going to be that much more careful before we forward on information we receive without even giving a thought to the fact that this might not be um, facts at all. It might just be fake news. So please watch and listen very carefully to what Kaylee has to say to us. And don't forget, um, in a short while, we'll also be joined by uh, Dr. Hayden Nips. He is a clinical psychologist, and we are going to be looking at the issue around anger management and rage. Kaylee, back to you mm. and um, this whole issue around, oh gosh, it's frightening, isn't it? <laughs> to think that you've got this little device which is a part yeah. of our lives, a part of our beings. We can't exist without this any longer. And yet the misinformation that we're taking in on a daily basis. But just before we get to what's crap on WhatsApp, mm. what about state capture, corruption, etc.? All these very big stories in the news um, in South Africa at the moment. Do you guys play a role in that at all? Um, not a very big role. Um, I think that would be heading more into the realm of investigative journalism. So we don't do too much work around state capture and corruption. But um, of course, if it's a, a statement that's been made in the public domain that we feel there's an appetite for this to be fact checked, then we will have a look at it. How are you guys funded? So um, our funding information is publicly available. We're very open about uh, how we're funded, so everyone can find that information on our website. Um, but some of our main funders are the Wraith Foundation, um, the Open Society Foundation. We also are funded by Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Wow. Okay, great. What's crap on WhatsApp? What's yeah. that all about? How do I protect myself and not forward on misinformation mm or fake news and get the whole community or the whole world in a panic. Yes. So WhatsApp for us has traditionally been quite a difficult platform to penetrate. So, I mean, previously we would do our regular fact checking work and publish it on our website and share it on Twitter and Facebook and kind of hope that it would find its way into WhatsApp. But the thing with WhatsApp is that it's a very, um, closed form of communication. Because you have specific groups. Yes, and unless somebody sends us a, a screenshot of a message that they've received or they forward us something, we don't actually know what kind of misinformation is being spread on the platform. 
And then the other thing is that it's, it's also quite a personal form of communication. So unlike maybe Facebook or Twitter where you're chatting to strangers or people you don't know, um, with WhatsApp, you know, you're talking to your mom, your, your husband, your colleagues, and there's almost this tendency to kind of believe what we get sent as the truth because it's being sent to us by somebody that we know. So these are our challenges, I think, are very particular to, to WhatsApp, and we've had to be a bit creative about how we address these challenges on the platform. What have you come across on WhatsApp and social media in general over the past year um, regarding sensationalism and just how blindly we accept all of that, very especially in terms of human trafficking, kidnapping. There's this big story going around um, of children being targeted in shopping malls, yeah. uh, babies being hijacked from mm -hmm. cars where people on street corners bash the, you know, the windscreens and then grab the babies out. And all of that kind of stuff is really sensationalism. Yeah. However, there might be some truth to it. I don't know if you guys have fact-checked any of that. Yeah, so, I mean, what you're saying is, is absolutely right. We, we do see a lot of that. Um, a lot of what's coming through are, are messages or claims around crime, um, around bogus health claims, so things like um, home remedies that can cure cancer. Mm. Um, and it is... I suppose in a way quite obvious, but it also plays on people's very real fears. So we and, know... and I guess if you're deep in that space, you you kind of grasping at straws, anything that's going to make you better, you kind of just accept it. Yeah, so it's, it's playing on people's very real fears. For example, in South Africa, we know that, that crime is an issue. And you get this message that says your house, if you see a, a can on the driveway, it means that your house is being targeted for robbery. And there's almost this kernel of truth in that that makes you think, oh, maybe this is something that is happening. Um, so what we're trying to do with WhatsApp is we um, have a dedicated WhatsApp line. And the number is 082-709-3527. We're asking people to forward us messages that they receive on WhatsApp. So anything that you feel is a little bit dodgy or a little bit suspicious, you can send that to us. And throughout the month, we will have a look at what we get sent and we will pick three or four recurring messages. So things that keep coming up, like the, the crime messages and the stories about kids being hijacked. And we will debunk them. But compared to our traditional fact-checking work where we are just writing up a report and putting it onto our website, we are feeding this information back into WhatsApp. Um, and we do this via a voice note show. So once a month, we will send this voice note show to all of our subscribers. Um, and they can then have a listen to what's true and, and what's not on WhatsApp. And I think what's really great about that is it's, it's quite fun. It's a fun way to receive your news. I mean, we're all very busy and we don't necessarily have time to sit online and read through a number of articles. But this we can listen to, you know, when we're driving home from work or perhaps when we're making dinner. Um, and the other cool thing is that it's very short. So it's only about six minutes long which means that it's very small in size. It's about seven megabytes, which means that it's cheap for people to download. Um, and it's also cheap for people to forward. And I think that is what I really like about this is that it's in a format that you can forward onto people in WhatsApp, particularly the person who sent you the piece of nonsense in the first place. Okay. How do I personally mm. fact check something if I receive, and we receive rubbish on a daily basis? Yeah. Um, and, and you do, there the, the comes, and it's all these closed community groups, and you don't want to offend anybody, mm. but you also want to correct misperceptions, and you also want them to start rethinking or thinking twice before they forward on nonsense and rubbish. It's also time wasters. Is there a tool available that I can go to personally instead of coming to you because you'll yeah. be unind inundated? Yeah. What is the two? What is it that I do to fact check um, nonsense that I receive? Number one mm -hmm. and number two, how is that different to spam, for example? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it's a great question because obviously we would like to fact check everything that we receive, but we just can't be everywhere all the time. So, um, there are always, I think, a couple of tips that people can keep in mind when you're receiving this kind of stuff. So, I always like to ask myself, who wrote this message? You'll notice that a lot of what we get sent, especially messages that are forward to us on WhatsApp. Um, don't say who wrote it. And if we don't know who wrote it, then how, how do we trust that what they're saying is true? Um, the other thing is that you ask if you can verify the claims. 
again, these forwarded messages very often will not say where the source is or where this information is coming from. Or if they do, you'll find that it's a known fake news site or something like that. Um, another thing that's good to do is ask yourself, is this information that's making me scared or angry? Because as we said earlier, a lot of the time these messages are playing on these fears. So the mm -hmm. minute something is, seems to have been created to get your emotions up, that's already a red flag. Um, I think also to be wary of pictures, audios, videos, and to it's be very aware. It's dangerous because yeah. a lot of, they, they could use a picture of a very innocent person and um, horrendous claims can be made against this person. So imagine how damaging it is to those people. So how do we fact check that yeah. in our own private capacities so as not to harm anybody in the mm. process? So often what we see is that pictures and videos can actually be digitally manipulated. Oh. Um, so we've got to be wary of that. But more often than not, I think what we're seeing is videos and pictures being used out of context. So they're real, um, they have actually happened, but maybe it didn't take place in South Africa, or maybe it's footage from 10 years ago. Um, but a really handy way to kind of check if something is real and if it's happening right now, as is being claimed, is with a Google reverse image search. So it's a free tool that people can access online. Um, you really just have to save the picture to your phone and upload it into Google's reverse image search. And what it will do is it will bring as up... As simple as that? As simple as that. Within Google seconds, reverse. Google reverse image search. If you Google it, it will come up straight away. And it gives you... Uh, it'll bring up all versions, all previous versions of this picture that have existed online before. So it's really great. It was very helpful for us during the xenophobic violence that took place earlier this year when people were claiming that xenophobic violence was taking place in Johannesburg. And we did a Google reverse image search on a picture only to see that it's actually from India. Oh, goodness. So very, very helpful to, mm -hmm. to do that. Okay. Um, as simple as that. <laughs> yes, it really is. Um, and I think these are just good tools to, to have in your, in your toolbox, if I can say so. Um, but I think, I mean, if you don't, if you're maybe not too good with technology or you're not super comfortable or you don't have the time to do that, I always say just Google is your friend um, because often, unfortunately, these fake messages that are spread around on WhatsApp are not very imaginative. So they have very long histories and they've been doing the rounds for years and they don't change very much. So you can be sure that someone has already fact checked it or there is some information already available. So if you just put that message into Google and see what comes up, um, often you'll find that there, there is information. And as you said, of course, then there's almost a responsibility to then feed that information absolutely, back. Absolutely. So you also say that um, once a month uh, you send out um, all the facts that you've checked yes. as Africa Check. Yeah. How does one subscribe to become a part of, you know, to be, uh, yes. to, to, to receive that? And are there costs involved? Okay, so it's very easy. Anyone can sign up as long as you have WhatsApp. The number is 082-709-3527. Um, but you must add us as a contact in your phone. Otherwise, you won't um, receive the podcast. And then just, you know, send us a message. Let us know who you are and, and where we can start a conversation and start fact-checking some of your crap messages. <laughs> there you go. And don't worry, we've not um, managed to get those numbers down. Um, we will, Kaylee will leave the numbers yeah. here at the studio and you can call in and we will forward the number on to you. Your website address? AfricaCheck.org. As simple as that? Yes. Anything in closing you'd like to share with our um, viewers this morning? Perhaps just that we accept reader suggestions. So if people have seen a claim that they want fact check, they can also send that to us. Um, they can tweet us. It's at Africa Check or um, our email address is info at Africa But you don't guarantee that it would be attended to because yeah. of the volume of work you're sitting with. Yeah, yeah. But we're always open to suggestions. So okay. previous, um, at the moment, between a, a half and a third of all the, the fact checking we do is actually coming from our readers. Brilliant. Yeah. Kaylee, it's been wonderful uh, chatting Thank with you. you and I am so thrilled that the, we have an organization like Africa Check yeah. to truly hold people to account. Thank you. Keep up the great work. Thank you. And good luck on Saturday. It's a big Thank day you. for you, isn't yes, it? It's it the day is. you get married. Yes. Thank Many you congratulations so much. and may all go well. Thank you. Thanks Thank so you much. for being with us and uh, lots of regards to everyone at Africa I Check. I will do so. Thank you.
And there you have it, Kaylee Clifford talking to us about a very important organization. They're affiliated with the Wits School of Journalism and they're here fulfilling a very, very important role in our lives. So don't worry, they are there. They are big brother, you know, and, and they'll play that role for as long as uh, possible. And if you need anything checked, they are your go-to people. In a short while, we will be joined by Dr. Hayden Nibs. We'll be talking anger management and rage, very especially this time of year. We are in silly season already and we know just what plays out on our roads, in our homes, in our workplaces. So all of that will be uncovered. Please stay with us. And welcome back. We are now going to be dedicating the rest of the hour, right up until 10 o'clock, to talk about a very important issue, and that is anger management, with clinical psychologist Dr. Hayden Nibs. He is based in Pretoria, and he's given up some of his very valuable time to come and talk about this very important matter with us. Now, the big question is, why is it that there are so many angry people walking around? What is it that is causing this short fuse in all of us. Um, it seems as if we don't have a sense of humor, we don't have any patience, we're irritable, we're anxious. And I kind of wonder, is it the country we're living in? Is it the work pressure? Um, is too much stuff going on in our lives, in our minds and around us? Is that part of the problem? Where and how does ADD and AD HD play a role. If I was diagnosed as a child with ADHD, does that mean I'm going to be growing up as a very, very angry young person and an angry adult? I don't know. We have the specialist in studio. Let's try and unpack all of that. Dr. Hayden Nibs, good morning. Welcome to the good morning. program. Thank you for having me. Well, you've heard my statement. Yes. I, <laughs> I kind of wonder, where does one start? When we talk anger management, yes. when we talk about short fuses, when we talk, is it personality types? Are you born to be an angry person? Is it your environment? Is it your life situation? Mm. What is going on? Why are we seeing that many angry people? I had a horrible incident on Saturday coming home from the mall and um, there was this guy on a Sunday afternoon ride and all I did was just give a little toot to indicate that I was going to overtake and make my way home. And the next best thing, he overtook me and he, he very nearly bashed me up. It was that bad. Sure. And I was shocked out of my life. Very I scary. I couldn't believe mm. um, and what could have happened. You know, the repercussions had I driven home and gotten my husband and son involved you could have had some sort of a fatality on your hands. Yeah. So what's going on? Okay, <laughs> that kind of an instance, uh, pe perhaps um, if I build a frame of reference first and we can, we can move forward to, to looking at, at instances like that. But essentially when it comes down to anger or anger management, I, I, I will say that the best place to begin is, is really looking at how come we start to, begin, uh, to become angry. If we begin there, Essentially, I, I won't necessarily say it's a personality type or anything connected like that. Uh, what we find, clinically speaking, is there, I, I will say there's initially two broad uh, clinically relevant elements that are, that are of, of, of dire importance. The one is expectations. Uh, under that umbrella, when our expectations of behavior or of a situation are in a certain way, and the environment or an individual does not fulfill our expectations. Ah. There's a difference. There we start to get uh, anger. The reason why we get anger there is actually the second umbrella. It is because classically one of our needs is blocked. It will depend on the need and depend on the context and numerous variables depending on the level of frustration we will get. But that's where frustration begins when one of our needs is classically blocked. Um, Can we not negotiate rather than losing our cool? And oh, by the way, apologies, I refer to you as Dr. Hayden yeah. Nibs. It's not doctor, no. is it? No. Just Hayden Nibs. Yes. 
<laughs> okay, there you go, Hayden. Um, what is it about us as human beings in this day and age where we're not able to negotiate? That comes down to numerous different variables, but that's exactly one of the points. When it comes down to anger, anger, basically in human functioning, everything, uh, symptomology, emotions, all of this really has a function in our lives. Anger, the, the role of anger and the function of anger is to fight. That's actually what anger does for us. Sometimes in certain uh, instances, in certain contexts, it's essential for human beings to be able to fight effectively. Uh, but really with anger all we can do is fight. Uh, typically with anger, if, if we have what we call a limited role repertoire, so for whatever reason we were raised, we, we, we weren't exposed to uh, a, a variety of ways to manage situations, uh, perhaps pushing and fighting and becoming aggressive worked very effectively over our lives. Uh, maybe it may be a limited way of managing environments then you are more likely to, to jump to that. Uh, so increasing the ability to engage the, 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 our toolbox, if you were, of um, things that we have our dis at our disposal uh, to change a situation, that, that is one avenue that we utilize. Because exactly as, you, as you're pointing out, a frustration comes from now a need that's blocked. Uh, depending on our level of expectations, we are very, very angered because there's a feeling of being wronged. Uh, but now, when it comes to anger, we must fight and we have no other variation, so that is what we will do. Uh, alternatively, if there is a varied ability or, let's say, we say a broader role repertoire, but essentially more elements in one's toolbox, let's say somebody is very argumentative or somebody is, is um, very empathic or very um, understanding, we will have the ability to go a different route. Um, but th th that is, if I can say, a broad picture, uh, a first nice snapshot of, of giving it an explanation. Are you suggesting that, for example, you're a very angry person, the slightest little um, trigger will set you off, and I am calm, um, I can reason, and would my calmness and reasoning ability um, in interacting with you calm you down and dissipate that anger in you or will it just push you further into possibly a rage and also are we also then perhaps can we look at this person who is constantly angry and possibly even flies into rages uh, as a bully? Well whether calmness will, will um, soften anger or douse the flame, if, if we can say that, that all depends on the how. Um, I won't say as a blanket statement that being calm in the face of anger is an effective uh, route. Uh, it really will depend on the context and the how. Uh, essentially, the person that's angry, now in this example it's me, <laughs> then uh, I, I would be housing a particular set of assumptions and expectations so something has now made me angry. Uh, and if, it's my fault. Yeah, so <laughs> let's say I didn't want water. <laughs> and now the fact that there's water has infuriated me. There, and that's unreasonable, is it not? Because you're actually looking for a scapegoat. You are so angry that you're actually blaming me for your mm. anger. It's, it's, it's my fault yeah. that I have, made, you know, Yes. I was the trigger, I said the wrong word, I gave you water instead of coffee, etc, etc. Yeah. So it's my fault that you're not angry. Anger is by and large linear and in that sense uh, always going to be blaming somebody or something. Um, so that's also indicating that the, the, the constantly angry person is not a very responsible person. Responsible, I'll say, <laughs> is on a different logical level. Okay. Uh, responsible Im implies ownership for, for one's role. There will be a gap there because with a linear view, one doesn't see one's own role classically. Um, but it, I, I will say responsible is perhaps a different concept that we can delve into. But when it comes to anger, I will say what happens is there is an expectation that was now blocked. So in the example, I expected now coffee. Uh, with something th that we say, in, in this example, it would be 
with psychology, we, we, we rather look, uh, instead of uh, placing a moral judgment on behavior, we look at appropriateness or expected behavior. So in this example, given the context here, it is probably going to be in the minority of the population that would respond in that way. Uh, so for me to do it, it would be a surprise. Uh, because it's not likely to, to garner so to garner real anger at water being there. Um, but what we would see there But there's other stuff happening in the background yes. so in your head. Yeah, it's either it's either that I'm sitting with, with a certain expectations, like I should be given coffee, um, and I've been wronged in some way by getting water. Uh, so there we have again the umbrella of the expectations. You will also find that some people's uh, reaches a level of anger very quickly. Uh, either there we can have a really sound expectation. Um, perhaps for whatever reason I, I, I am of the strong belief that coffee is supposed to be there when being interviewed, I don't know. Um, then if this belief is, is something so core and it really blocks one of my needs and it's starkly against what I'm expecting, you might find anger from that situation alone. That would we, we in this example that that is likely to be a rare belief, uh, or ex, rather expectation, a rare expectation of behaviour and, and of the environment. Um, but let us, for argument's sake, say it is is one. Another avenue that we we will often see is the build up of unfinished business and the build up of frustration. So there you say, am I? Would I not be looking for a scapegoat? So I'm angry about something else. I will say yes and no. Uh, it is. It may be that I'm carrying unfinished business that's not connected. Okay, hold that thought. We'll continue with it right after ah. the ad break. And also the issue around people that will just not let go of old issues. Yeah. And they keep rehashing it and rehashing it and create anger and a situation of conflict around yes. that. Hayden Nibs is a clinical psychologist based in Pretoria. He's here to talk to us about anger management. We're going to try and unpack as much as we can in uh, the next uh, 30 minutes or so. Interesting, and uh, we do hope you're going to uh, keep us company right up until 10 o'clock. Anger management is what we're talking about. And if you have that problem or a loved one in your life, then please stay listening and watching closely because you might just pick up a tip or two to be able to better manage your situation and the situation of your loved one. Is that being too easy? <laughs> is that a very, is that a cop out? <laughs> no, 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 it's a complicated topic, um, but certainly one can, can uh, assist each other. Uh, but I, I just want to, just before the break, we were talking, uh, touching on the concept of a bit of unfinished business. That we, right, we someone it. who keeps at any and every opportunity. You'd, you'd be in company having a wonderful dinner or whatever the case may be, and you may just have used the wrong term, wrong word or something. Yes. And it then it almost gives the opposite party the permission to uh, bring up an old story um, and start a, a, a huge issue and a big fight around it. So what we see with unfinished business is, is essentially two things that tend to occur. Unfinished business refers to, let's say, impact, so something that has happened in your life that have not been effectively worked through or resolved. So let us say, for argument's sake, you, a boss, an old boss of yours mistreated you. Um, and then you go to a new job. The moment you start talking to your boss, you are weary. That is unfinished business. You're carrying an old wound with you. How do you deal with that? And very especially with your loved one, because you're too afraid. You've come to a point in your life where you've got to tread really very carefully around him or her because if you don't, it's going to trigger that unfinished business and you're going to have that stuck record syndrome coming up all over again. What do you do in a situation like that? I mean, I know what you're going to suggest is that the person has to go in for therapy, but <laughs> as the partner, you're trying to assist. Well, let me explain theoretically what one has to do with unfinished business. 
the instinct or the pull is to avoid it because we want to not uh, trigger the anger or the frustration or whatever it is that, that is at hand. Um, but unfinished business does not heal. It follows the laws of emotion. Oh. People seem to think that emotions are illogical. They are extremely logical. They follow a certain set of rules. They just follow different rules to logic. Logic's rules are simple. Not simple. They are like this. If we can deduce an outcome, it then becomes. So let us say I gave you a fright right now by pretending that we were being robbed. You would have an emotional response. You then discover we are not being robbed. It is a hoax. Logically, your fright and your startled emotion should just be gone because the situation is logically different. But the laws of the emotion don't follow deduction. Ah. So you will still feel shocked and shaken. The way and possibly angry at you 100%. for putting me in that uh, exactly. emotional state. 100%. The laws of emotion are this. In order for us to effectively process an emotion, they have to be acknowledged and um, understood. So let us say I do this prank and you are now startled and a bit frustrated. You will sit with the emotion. You will try and ignore it. Oh, no, no, let's go on. I don't feel that way. You will still feel that way. If you voice it and you say, sure, I'm actually so startled by this and I'm, frankly, I'm a bit angry. If I acknowledge it, if I get it, if I sit here and I say, you know what, if I was you, actually I can understand why you're angry. Is I would also be startled. The is moment you, you acknowledge an emotion uh, that you feel that it is heard, it goes. Acknowledge you and apology or just acknowledgement? Don't even have to apologize. You don't? Apology Sure, are we deviating from anger, <laughs> but just for the but sake of clarity, of yes. the process message in apology is a re essentially a maneuver for reassurance and forgiveness. So let's say, so I have now this prank, it's a silly example, but now we stick with this. This prank has occurred and you are shocked and you look at me and you say, how could you do that? And I can observe your anger and I immediately say, oh, I'm sorry, I'm so, so sorry. You are unable in that moment to feel heard of why you are angry. Ah. All your response can be is not forgive me, or it is to let me off the hook. Right. Okay, I'm sorry. Okay, I see you didn't mean it. But you so will you still... So you just anger the, the person even more. You will still sit with the emotion. The laws of emotion are, it must be acknowledged. Again, it follows logical laws. They're just different. So if I can apologize, but I have to first understand if I first say, sure, I can see why you were angry. And if I can, obviously I cannot uh, be lying. If I get it, if I really think, yo, actually that was a really uh, an inappropriate prank and I can understand why you're angry. If you feel that I get it, you will find the emotion goes. At that stage, I can apologize. I can say, actually, I didn't mean that. I'm sorry for that. The impact I wanted was playful, fun. Mm, mm. I, I really didn't intend to anger you or, or startle you and I'm very sorry. There you will accept it because now you see my intention is different but you first have to be acknowledged. Jumping back to anger with the unfinished business, if it is that in a, within a relationship there is profound unfinished business, uh, the viewers are not going to like me for this, you will have to go back. You will have to talk about what c caused the unfinished business and you will have to get it. Let us say this prank occurred and I leave here and two months later you invite me back and I sit here again and I sit down. You may find you think, oh, that guy, that's the unfinished business. <laughs> right. Now you, you see, we will literally yeah. have to go back and I will have to say, remember two months ago with that prank, I thought a lot about it and I get why I startled you and I, I, I can see why you must have been angry. You will also have to be vulnerable enough technically and say, yeah, I was actually angry, then we will settle it. You will actually see that your view of me, your perception of me, will, will actually alter. Okay, uh, we're going to talk a little later on about um, why therapy is important for people who have anger issues and the type of therapy that is very helpful. But that being said, how much of depression, anxiety, etc. is involved in the angry person's life. If you see a person who's constantly angry or flies off the handle at the slightest of provocation, is irritable a lot of the time, and you 
nervous in his or her presence? Is there perhaps uh, a situation of deep depression maybe, anxiety? What's going on that the person is in that constant frame of mind? I will separate anxiety and, and depression from anger. They are clinically different uh, patterns that we observe. Um, actually, in a moment, you cannot be angry and depressed at the same time. If you, it's either or. Yes, they are polar opposites. Um, if, 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 that is not to say somebody that's angry cannot be depressed, mm -hmm. but you will not be it, it at the same time. If you are deeply depressed, you are not angry in that moment. No, because you don't have the energy to be angry. In fact, if you become angry, you will literally move out of your depression. Mm -hmm. But um, if we a bit put that aside, when it comes to that, that uh, person being consistently angry, constantly angry, if there are other clinical factors at play, they can then become depressed or they can become anxious. But I will not say that the two, the, the concepts are, are, are causally linked or even typically uh, seen within the, within the pattern. The, the, really the heart of anger comes with that expectation, unfinished business, so essentially, where I said that role repertoire, essentially somebody is not uh, effectively fulfilling their needs within the environment. It can be that they don't truly uh, view the environment with the clarity that there is. There, clinically speaking or therapeutically, we may facilitate uh, empathy or a clearer view of the context. In, in that instance, empathy assists us in a, in a really crisp view um, that will lower or shift, not lower, shift expectations to a realistic uh, connection to the environment and we will start to find anger lowers. Um, within fulfilling of needs we are very often in, in contexts that we cannot control. Uh, there when we become angry we disempower ourselves. If we fully understand the context we will lower the anger. Uh, there is also which we have not yet touched on. Uh, anger as I said really creates the, the, the you use it to fight but there's typically a Typically, anger is a secondary emotion. Um, you may be hurt and then become angry. Ah. You may feel a feeling of, of mis, uh, uh, wronged, uh, a sense of injustice, become angry. If we are angry, we can do nothing with what caused it. For example, if I, again, we use us, but if I say something hurtful and you become angry, once you are angry, all you can do is fight. So you can hurt me back or fight. If you, and that's a natural response, is it, it not? It can be, it moves very quickly. Mm -hmm. But if you stay with the primary emotion, you are now hurt. You can do something with the hurt. You can say to me, sure, that actually hurt me. We can clear it. But if you are angry and you fight, I can only get hurt back or defend. But you will not address the hurt. You have quite a conflicting situation where you probably end up, um, you know, throwing punches at each other. We're going for another ad break. When we come back, let's just quickly look, look at the difference of rage is, you know, how seriously angry do you have to be to get into a fit of rage? How dangerous is it to you, the person having this episode and people around you? And then also the type of therapeutic interventions that can be put into place to help your loved one suffering from this condition. Anger management is what we're talking about with Hayden Nips, clinical psychologist from Pretoria. We're going for an ad break and we'll come back another 12 minutes and then the interview will be up. So we'll try and cram in as much as we can. Okay, and the good news is that we have Hayden in studio for at least another 30 minutes. So uh, we will try and, and unpack as much as we possibly can. So it is anger management that we're talking about. It's a natural emotion. Yes. It's okay to get angry from time to time. It's okay to have a tantrum. Uh, but when, how does one draw the lines? When do you alert your friend or your partner that things are getting out of hand. Please hear me, I can't deal with you any longer. You are draining me and I'm fearful to be in your presence. Do you get that often enough in your practice and how do you deal with it? What do you say to the person when they put this to you? Yes, um, well, first of all, um, I, I will say all emotions are, are, are natural. Um, there's, 
there's really no, no accuracy in judging human behavior or human emotions. It's rather in observing outcomes and intention. So if your intention is to win or destroy, anger is very effective. Then it is something that I would recommend. But if your intention is to create closeness, typically in a marriage, uh, if your intention is to be heard in most discussions, that will be typically where it is. Anger, I find to be extremely ineffective. Classically, you will have a completely different outcome when you engage in that way. When somebody in your life is very aggressively engaging with high levels of anger, you say, when is it the point in time? Probably in the very moment of anger, it will be impossible for them to hear you. But I, if one wishes to have a close relationship that does not have unfinished business, that alters perception or creates distance, one must clear out impacts. So I will certainly say one should approach one's partner and state the impact of the behavior, that you feel scared. Um, if it is that the now we go to a different concept of power struggles within human interaction. Oh. But if it is of a nature that you will not be heard, I would strongly recommend therapy. Because the role of a therapist will allow both parties to hear each other. A therapist, you said, how will we deal with this? Uh, let us say in the context of a marriage uh, and one partner is with high levels of anger uh, and with high levels of aggression. Um, we will first work on an emotional level for both parties. There will be consequences of the behavior on the, the one person. So they will have to vent that. They will have to process the emotions. There will also be a huge buildup on the side of the person that is sitting with the anger. They will have to vent that. Then we will have to facilitate. So it is more than just giving information. There's a bit of a misconception that therapy is some sort of an education. <laughs> uh, we shift functioning. We don't just explain it. Um, so we will shift functioning from an individual that ha holds certain expectations to a clearer view. We'll facilitate empathy so that they start to feel what other people feel. They start to see it. Their aggression and linearity fades because now, for example, if we go back, for those that have been watching since the beginning, earlier there was a, a very silly example of coffee and water. If I started to put but myself... It, it, it would take something as trivial as can that do. to create uh, an episode of rage, perhaps. It can. And let me just come in here yes. also to ask, you mentioned anger, you mentioned aggression, and I'm bringing up the word rage. What are the similarities there? And if you're an angry, constantly angry person, um, is there a possibility that you're going to have episodes of rage, how dangerous is that to yourself and the people around you? Yeah. And does it mean that if you're an angry person, you're a naturally aggressive person? What's the difference? Anger and rage are emotions. Aggression is behavior. Uh, so typically one is angry and then behaves aggressively. Uh -huh. But you, you, you don't feel aggressive. You behave, you behave aggressively. Okay. Uh, so that's really the, the logical difference. Rage and anger are a matter of degree. Uh, so it is uh, escalation, uh, frustration below that. Right. Uh, but that one, we can arbitrarily draw lines. I find it most effective to make it subjective. Uh, livid, for argument's sake, somebody might subjectively say that I feel livid and consider it above rage, where somebody else might say they feel enraged, where it's above livid. So that one, I will say, is rather a matter of degree. Uh, rage is typically so intense that there will definitely be some behavior connected to it. Very challenging to just sit with rage and do nothing. Um, where anger, one may not act on it, uh, but if the view doesn't change and the emotion is not processed, sure, now, anger will, if anger is not expressed and it's kept... Is it a good idea to express it? <sighs> See, yes, where it gets. Rather than, you know, bottling it up. If and, you, you know, bottle you it up, typically it turns inward. Oh. And then you start to blame yourself. And that 
is part of what creates depression. Uh huh. So it's all right. Very so interconnected. I can see that. Earlier on, I asked you about: um, Is an angry person, an aggressive person, a bully? And uh, I'm also wondering about um, learned behaviour. Yes. Is anger a learned behaviour? And I know you've tied it in. And it makes a lot of sense with unfinished business yeah. of ne of not being heard, expectations not being yes. met, all of that. Would you, are you then suggesting that this person, um, this poor soul, has got so much of unfinished business, all of his or her expectations are never or hardly ever met, and they're just not being heard? What needs to be fixed in that person's life? not to be viewed as this horrible, aggressive monster or a bully. And how much of possible role modeling has happened in his or her life from the time they were little, that this is the way they behave? Yeah, well, <laughs> there, there's quite a lot clinically that we would, we would look at shifting. It really is case specific. Um, it's very hard to give a blanket statement. Sure. Probably one of the main cornerstones would be empathy. The higher levels of empathy, typically, um, the more understanding we have for individual behavior, for the context. So our expectations almost automatically shift. Um, if we understand somebody else's stance when they didn't do something that we expected, oh, I know why, I really see it, the, the expectation shifts, because then I don't expect the behavior. I see why it occurred that way. So empathy is really, really a powerful tool uh, in shifting that. Empathy might be overshadowed by the unfinished business, then it needs to be cleared. But it's not that all times anger is connected to unfinished business. Um, it can also be connected to the expectations. Uh, well, it will be already. Mm -hmm. um, you said learned behavior. In that sense, what, with what I was referring to earlier, that role repertoire, if we only learn one way to engage our environment, that will be the only one we know until we learn more. Oh, you just answered my question, and that is obviously through counseling, through therapy, you can learn, you can change your behavior, yes. but you must want to change your behavior. Yes, therapy, all therapies, it is um, obviously a scientifically based intervention, uh, but it is not about control, it is about healing. If somebody literally refuses it, it's not as though you can force it. It doesn't control behavior. Why do people resist therapy then for whatever, you know, whatever the condition is, but mainly for these type of situations? Sure, that is so fast. <laughs> it really depends on, on individual circumstances. Uh -huh. Very often um, Is it that they're afraid? I mean, you've just used a word now, control. Is it afraid they're going to lose control? I Possibly? find... Now I'm going to make a big jump. <laughs> a certain type of therapies have that impact. Okay. Um, clinical hypnosis, for argument's sake, I find some people worry uh, a bit of a misconception that there's a control element. Uh -huh. Most of the time, other therapeutic interventions, there's not really a fear of control. There is just either an engagement or not. If somebody, or change of behavior. Yeah, what I'm rather saying is therapy cannot be used to control. Oh. If you have somebody that does not wish to get, get any input, you cannot force therapeutic change. So in line with what you said, one does have to want to change. Mm -hmm. uh, that's also why, clinically speaking, we work in line with, with what we will term a presenting complaint. For example, if somebody comes in to my, my office, and their presenting complaint is, my wife won't do what she's told, now I'm being very extreme, then that is what we work with. It is from their world that we work. They may display anger, and you may think they need to be shifted in their anger. What I will facilitate is how to communicate in a way that she can hear you, so that and if he's sitting with anger, we will still heal the unfinished business. Ironically, you will probably do the same thing, but the frame of reference is person-centered. 
that person comes with a particular presenting complaint. That is what, how they engage they, with their world and their gap. If they come and they say, I feel down, I'm depressed, that is where we will work. Absolutely. If, You've got to hear him. Yes. Mm -hmm. I, I must be honest, it, it, it is also, when, when you view the whole picture, very often somebody will present something and not see the, the wood from the trees. So there, we will still work in line from how they are, are viewing it, but you, you may allow them to shift something else that creates massive healing and massive relief. Um, in a sense, that person that says, my wife is not doing what she's told, uh, in, in this limited uh, information example, you might find that that person constantly sits with anger. And we end up working with shifting uh, that emotion of anger and, and, and changing their world in that way. And they see it a bit differently. Um, but it is not a matter of, oh, you are actually too angry. We're going to work on anger management now. <laughs> Okay, let's go for an ad break. I want to talk about CBT. I've been told it's one of the best tools or therapeutic tools to deal with anger management. You can agree or disagree and give me reasons for why. Uh, we definitely are going to go into the last segment of this interview, but let's take an ad break first. And we are definitely into the final segment of the interview. Uh, anger management is what we're talking about. And the question I put to Hayden Nibs before the ad break was uh, CBT. Is that, you know, is that type of therapy the type, well, I've been told that it's very effective in managing anger. Um, is that in fact true or not? Your thoughts? Yes, uh, it, it is. Um... It can be very effective. Uh, many of the techniques in, in, in the, the, it's cognitive behavioral therapy for, for those that don't know the acronym. Um, many of the therapeutic techniques used in that paradigm are very effective. Uh, I myself use it uh, routinely. Wow. But you've got to be conscious of it all the time. What do you mean? Conscious that you're actually changing your stance. And, and As a therapist? No, no, for the patient maybe even the therapist. So if I come to you and I need a change of behavior because I'm very, very angry and you're going to tell me how to go about it via the CBT route, I have to be conscious constantly of changing my behavior it in all of my interactions. Yeah, it will depend. Some of the CBT interventions work a bit like that, the more behavioralistic ones. Some of the ones that are more cognitive in focus don't work like that. They will create a bit of shifts in perception. Uh, so there, it, it's really um, can be profoundly effective when we're looking at those expectations, because there we start to broaden the frame of reference to view it a bit differently, and then we expect different outcomes. So there, if a, if a, if a shift is made therapeutically, you won't necessarily go out and try and shift the expectation. You will literally see the world differently. Okay. And you will see a fuller picture. So now you will no longer expect because you which, understand. Which means you're going to be behaving differently. Probably yes. In fact, People you around you are going to notice the behavior change. That depends. Are they not going to? Are they not going to trigger you by perhaps c commenting on the behavior changes, even though they're positive? They view them as being positive, and not say to you, "Jupiter Hayden, you know, it, it's so nice interacting with you now, as opposed to a couple of months ago. What's changed?" And that might just trigger you. It might, mm -hmm. but it will all depend. If if you have managed to make effective shifts, it probably okay. won't. Okay. Uh, but if, if we foresee that, that likelihood therapeutically, we will routinely preempt. Change typically happens like that. Uh, we, when we shift, we all kind of, our behavior nets together with those around us, a bit like a, we call it a system, but it's a bit like cogs in a machine. So if we create therapeutic change, we change the direction of the movement by proxy other human beings around you start to change their behavior and notice and feel the impacts of the change. But systems try to retain equilibrium, so they will behave in a way that pushes you back. So we, we actively preempt this in therapy, so that when somebody makes a comment, you are expecting it and you understand how it works. So okay. we are a few steps ahead. <laughs> when you talk anger management, when you talk rage, etc., are we talking a mental health issue? Um, the majority of us, I'd like to think, are pretty regular people, but you are in constant 
um, you know, you're aggressive all of the time and can fly into a rage at the slightest provocation, is that suggesting that you have a mental health issue? It can. There are some elements. Let me, let me rather just clarify. The, the mental health is such a loaded term. It's such a difficult one to, to really filter through. In my opinion, if one has subjective discomfort, one does not have to. One can find a route that that is settled. There is really a matter of degree and a matter of uh, symptomology that classically fulfill the criteria for a diagnosis when somebody has, for example, in line with anger, a, a, a diagnosis is intermittent explosive disorder. Mm. So essentially that one will have particular criteria that exist that if one fulfills, one will be diagnosed with that. My view is that that, uh, psychiatrically speaking, is of use. Uh, and certainly as a, as a clinical psychologist, we will utilize diagnosis for certain contexts. But I prefer to follow the route of subjective experience. If you are angry sometimes or very often get enraged and for you it is a bother, then it is something that is blocking your world. Then it is something that can be, that can be addressed and healed. Uh, in a way that allows you to feel better, feel happier, feel more content. In that sense, there we are able to make profound shifts that really, really assist um, without having to push or, 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 or create a box that somebody sits in. I think I put this question to you earlier on. Let's just go back to it. Is there a certain personality type that um, kind of would present with aggression and anger issues. And I'm also thinking, let's look at the three-year-old that has temper tantrums and they never quite outgrow it. Even into adolescence and their teenage years, they always have these fits of temper. What should have been done at that stage in the child's life to prevent a very aggressive, angry adult? Okay, look, we, we, we do typically find some if somebody is being very, very aggressive, they're typically a little bit more assertive. That is not to say that assertive people are aggressive. That, that's why I, I rather steer clear of... I'm talking about the real aggressor. Yeah, I, I rather steer clear of personality types. Uh, we, we will probably see if somebody is constantly aggressive, very, very angry, really a limited access to, to roots of engaging with the environment. So they will, they will tend to, to engage a bit like that, but I, I, I rather move away from the concept of, of, of personality types regarding anger. Uh, really, it's more, more useful if we focus on these clinical elements at play. When it comes to children developing, children, sure, that's a whole nother, but <laughs> let me say it like, a bit like oh. this. You have a human being, if I can give this frame uh, to, to perhaps adopt to, to understand. A human being is born and they have no frame of reference for right or wrong. They have no frame of reference for their environment. And they literally start to grow, a bit like a, a plant that you put somewhere in the ground. Their parents, or whatever their environment is, tries to shape them. You give them inputs and you give them guidance and limitations. As they move through the world, they have needs and they try and fulfill their needs. They literally have no frame for what is morally right or accepted and they try different things. They try to cry. Oh, it worked. Then they will cry. They try to push a bit. If that doesn't work, they won't push. If they try to have a temper tantrum and it gains something, they will do it again. If they they will probably bite a child. If the biting had an environmental response that was in line with something that they wanted, here yeah, it's very often to identify, uh, very often challenging to identify it, but if the behavior is seen or experienced in their world as any somewhat effective, they will continue. Uh -huh. If not, they will not. There's no judgment behind it. They literally, they, they, they a bit grow, I, I, I envisage it in my head like the roots of a plant. Where the water is, the roots will grow. If it is not there, it will not grow there. I also I find, and I want to invite the people out there to have empathy for parents as well. You, I will routinely see somebody watch a child 
crying or have a ten temper tantrum and the person will say, my child would never do that. <laughs> and it might be true, but that means you, that is not a crack. Your child will try it and it will not work. So your child will not do that. But your child will do the one thing that gets you because the child will literally learn the gap that he, he or she has at their disposal. That parent's gap is that temper tantrum. Absolutely. And that is why that child is using it. They can shift their gaps, yes, and we as parents can obviously always move things around, but essentially it, it is a clean slate human being that is literally going to learn where the gap is. That is what they do. Ironically, we need to give them a bit of gaps as well. They must reach water. If you close off every gap, they will develop something else. They will find life. They will become powerfully manipulative to find what they, they, they have to do. They, they, they will find it. So and that's what life is all about. Yeah. We've come to the end of the interview. Can you very quickly in the next minute summarize anger, aggression, anger management? Anger and does it work? Can yes. we go for anger management and be a better version of ourselves? Ah, <laughs> kill me with better, more effective version. There you go. I've learned something new. Um, uh, in short, anger is a secondary emotion. There is typically something else that impacted us first. If we can learn how to manage that and fulfill our need effectively, we will not build up that discomfort of anger and we will actually start to become happy. We will see clearer the world, what we are expecting from it will, will not be such a frustration because we will understand what is to come and we can engage effectively in fulfilling our needs. We can avoid those outbursts of anger in traffic when we understand why somebody drives the way that they drive. We didn't even get to that. but. Uh, and we, we can, if we are to engage in a way that actually fulfills our need um, and lowers that ingrained frustration uh, in the here and now and then working through things that have really, really built frustration and altered our perception and that we carry uh, with the unfinished business, expanding our way to engage with the world and our view of it. And that's where we leave it. Thank you indeed for being with us on the show this morning. Thank you for having me. Anger management, how to manage it. Um, and I think from what I've learned uh, through this interview with Hayden is that um, therapy is really the route to go. There's lots of issues around unfinished business, issues around uh, me, uh, needs that have not been met. And I think more importantly, not being heard. And we can't express these type of feelings uh, with those closest to us and the best person to go to is the therapist they'd be able to help unpack and get you on the road to recovery don't know what Hayden would say about that about recovery but for another show maybe that's it for the show then thank you indeed for being with us um, I thoroughly enjoyed this past hour with Hayden and uh, we definitely will have him back in studio possibly in the new year to talk a whole host of other psychological matters. For now, take care on the roads. As always, um, it's been wonderful having you um, keeping us company. And till the next time, as always, Khudafiz from me, Julie Ali.